Welcome to this uh, PowerPoint pre uh, presentation and short video on the subject of the representation of light in painting, brought to you by uh, www.nicholaswyatt.com and the art class online. Uh, the representation of light in painting is a subject that has obviously occupied artists. Um, and I'm talking about the Western tradition um, specifically in the case of this video for um, the past five, 600 years. And the representation of light has varied over the different cultural periods um, of that time. And in this video, we're going to look at about four or five different ways in which light has been represented by artists in painting and really ask the question of whether the representation of light is fundamentally different from say for example the middle ages to the contemporary period or is it all just the same light and the the whole question can be summarized in really this sentence is the light of the world that's to say the the religious christian view of light the same light as the light of the enlightenment in other words is the representation of light different from uh, the period when painting was fundamentally for a religious purpose and did the representation of light change when painting started to represent the world of the Enlightenment um, during the 17th century and since then? I'm going to refer to examples of uh, painting, both historical and present, including my own. And we're just going to start with this was a painting that I made in 2013 titled Annunciation. And the representation of light in this painting is fundamentally a recognizable representation of light as we would understand it now. That's to say it, it really resides in a form of a, a naturalism. The scene itself is taken from a cinematic still and um, there are quotations from Baroque iconography. Likewise with this painting, uh, again, a nocturnal scene, but again, the representation of light is fundamentally, uh, if you like, a cinematic representation of light. However, uh, things have not always been uh, that case. The representation of light is a fundamental property of painting. Light is a phenomenon of the physical world, but its representation in painting, like all representations, is culturally determined by social, religious, political and aesthetic factors and between faith and reason. This presentation will look at the different ways the representation of light has developed in the European painting tradition over the past 700 years. And we'll consider the question, is the light of the world the, the religious light of the world, the same light as the light of the enlightenment, the light of the rational world. I look at this development not only from art history, but also from my own viewpoint as a painter. And um, I just want to start off by really having a look at uh, medieval painting. Light as a defined metaphor is really the characteristic of, of light in medieval art. We'll have a look at the Wilton diptych in a short while. Now, um, the medieval world saw light in fundamentally different ways to the contemporary world. Light in the medieval world was a expression of God's light, of divine light. So in the case of uh, a painting like the Wilton dip, Diptych, 
you have a, a situation where the the gold leaf is a representation of divine light but it's not a naturalistic representation of divine light it's a symbolic representation of divine light the 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 divine light is uh, what is known as originary that's to say it it originates from god from the divine and is not a property of the the natural world um, everything in medieval aesthetics is a property of the divine and the gold leaf here in the wilton diptych represents that divine light. Saint Augustine of Hippo, 354 to 430 AD, the early Christian theologian and philosopher, draws a distinction between the light of God and the light of the senses. According to Saint Augustine, the true good light of God does not reveal earthly sensual delights or pleasures, but inner spiritual light. And, and this is what we see here in this painting of the Wilton Diptych. In medieval aesthetics, light is conceived as a property of the divine and light in medieval painting is a clear, lucid, uniform, shadowless, and most importantly, originary quality. That is to say, emanating from the divine. A good example of which is the stained glass of medieval cathedrals through which the light of God is apprehended through the earthly beauty of color. And so we can see in the Wilton Diptych, the, uh, the physical manifestation of this medieval understanding of light. I'm just gonna show you another couple of examples. Uh, the painting here in the National Gallery, the Master of, the Master of Lisbon, Altarpiece 1465 to 1490. Again, the, the light is not a temporal light, it's a spiritual light. And also the space depicted by this light, it's an infinite space. It's not a finite space that you get in later renditions of uh, European painting. Um, this particular painting, Lorenzo Monaco, you can see here how the, the this notion of, of the representation of light owes a great deal to uh, the influence of Byzantine art, uh, where the actual light, as in the gold leaf in icon paintings, is a symbol of God's light. Um, this slowly begins to change to a degree um, in the early 14th century, because we, we get the first intimations of a, a, a human sense perception of the world in the, term, in the form of uh, a very, very basic form of perspective. And there is a, a real space that is being described here. Uh, not a not an infinite space that you find in these paintings, um, but it's an idealized space and and the light is uh, still fairly shadowless, although some intimations of shadow are beginning to occur in European painting. As we move on in the European tradition of painting, we've moved on another hundred years or so now, looking at Piero della Francesca in the Nativity. Uh, by now, the, the human sense perception of the world is becoming much more clearly established in painting. So we see here examples of uh, perspective, which the artist is employing here in the, uh, in the, in the in the kind of stable, um, a sense of actual real space. We can walk into this painting. Um, the landscape is something that we can walk into and around. You know, the landscape lies behind the stable. The stable lies behind the people. The Christ child lies in front of the people. 
So uh, a real space is, is now being constructed here and equally a real, uh, well, not a natural light, but a earthly light is being uh, hinted at here. So we have the, the light of the sun being cast over the stable. I mean, some might argue it's the, the light of, of God, but uh, it's, it's represented as a fairly kind of natural light and, and it's falling on the roof and the roof, the stable is casting a shadow. And, but still the, the, world, the world that this painting depicts is, is to a large extent, quite a sort of, still a shadowless world we're not really in the representation of light and shadow yet, although the first inklings are beginning to creep in in, in, in this painting of the early Renaissance. So the second, second stage of painting of light we're going to look at is light as mystical drama and devotion. And we're gonna look at the paintings of Leonardo da Vinci, um, Michelangelo, Marisi de Caravaggio, and uh, El Greco. Now, the thing to say about these artists is there's, there's a fundamental change in the representation of light occurs in their work. And um, it's light is no longer a, a symbol of uh, uh, the divine. It, light is conceived in the work of these painters as a, a, a representation of a mystical drama and devotion. So if, for example, we look firstly at the work of uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, his famous painting, The Virgin of the Rocks in the, uh, in the National Gallery in London. Individualization and the consciousness of a self gain greater currency in the Renaissance. This sense of perception of the individual and the artist as an individual creator in relation to the natural world, we think here of da Vinci, finds an aesthetic equivalence in, in his uh, naturalistic representations embodying shadow, chiaroscura and sfumato. So Leonardo da Vinci is, a, is an embodiment of a new awareness, realization and consciousness in the European mind of a sense of selfhood, um, which didn't exist in the same way in the, in the medieval period. Um, by, by the Renaissance, um, there, there, there arose in, in European consciousness, a sense of the value of the individual and of, of individual selfhood. That's to say one, one, one person's experience being different from another person's experience and that person being aware of their experience and, more, and most fundamentally of their sense perceptions. Th these ideas were, are, are all being played out in Leonardo da Vinci's paintings. And if we go and look at uh, the work of uh, Caravaggio, um, working at the end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th century, we see here really uh, light as mystical drama. And um, what I mean by that is that um, the, 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 the scene of uh, the raising of Lazarus is being treated here by Caravaggio uh, in obviously very dramatic terms. It's a dramatic event. And uh, Caravaggio is using light to actually express this, this mystical drama. So in contrast to da Vinci's natural uh, mysteriousness in, in his paintings of the Virgin of the Rock, artists such as uh, Caravaggio in the Counter-Reformation countries, and we're talking here about Spain, Italy, I mean, Caravaggio is Italian, um, in response to the requirements of the Counter-Reformation and the Council of Trent, wanted to produce uh, an art that could be understood by the people so that the, 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 the message of the Catholic Church wanted to 
uh, convey to congregations as an aid to devotion and prayer had to be visual and it had to be uh, almost laid out in, in cinematic terms. And um, they, they, these, they, they, these ideas produced an art of religious narrative uh, that directed itself and was uh, intended to excite the emotions in the service of prayerful devotion, a religious meditation and artists elected to use light um, as, a, as an aid to uh, creating drama and as an aid to spiritual religious devotion. And perhaps the, 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 you know, one of the great examples of this is the Spanish artist El Greco and his painting here of the Immaculate Conception. Now th this painting is somewhat different from Caravaggio's in the sense that in the Caravaggio, we, 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 get, we get a sense of a directional light. It's, 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 you know, Caravaggio is using ideas of light and shade, um, and he's using them in a fairly kind of realistic way. We can quite clearly see from the painting here that the light is emanating from the, the top left because it's catching Christ's shoulder and it's falling on the limbs and on Lazarus. Um, however, in the work of El Greco, uh, there, there is no identifiable earthly source for the light. That's to say El Greco's uh, religious sacred figures emanate light themselves. And that's because of the way El Greco constructed his paintings. The paintings are painted uh, it should be mentioned here that El Greco originally trained as a icon painter in the Byzantine tradition because he was born in Crete. He made his way over to Venice, um, obviously became aware of Venetian uh, colour painting. Uh, think of painters like Titian, um, Tintoretto, Veronese. And then he moves down to Rome and uh, obviously becomes aware of the work of Michelangelo, Raphael. And there's a wonderful amalgam of the color of Venetian painting and the monumentality and the, uh, the, um, the, 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 the dynamic energy that you find in Roman painting of the period. But El Greco doesn't stay in Rome. He, he moves to Toledo in Spain, which was a religious center at the beginning of the uh, 17th century. And there gains many commissions for churches. And in the construction of his paintings, he still uh, keeps hold of some of the icon traditions. So in the case of this painting, the Immaculate Conception, he, he would have put down a a red, what is known as a red bowl, B-O-L-E ground, which is the type of ground that is laid down in icon painting. And of course, in the context of icon painting, the ground, the red bowl ground is, is symbolic of uh, the earth, of, of God's earth and of, of huma, huma, humanity, humanis. And it's, it's, with this sort of like fairly mid-tone to dark ground, um, El Greco then overlays these cooler blue, bluey gray tones for the sky. But it's in the painting of the figures that we see this kind of spiritual light. Um, a, a visitor to his studio once asked El Greco, why do you paint in the why do you paint in the dark? Why do you not have the windows open to your studio? And El Greco is, is supposed to have replied, because I experience, my paintings are experiences of an inner light. And this is really what is being created here in these figures. So El Greco would start off by painting the, the, the shadow, the, the dark areas. But whilst these dark areas, the shadows of the figures is still wet, the paint is still wet. He would then add lighter tones, uh, whites, um, coral greys, blue greys, yellow green greys, and work in these modulations of the light 
in a wet into wet painting process. And then as the final sort of coup on the painting, he would actually drag, whilst the paint is still wet, these beautiful white highlights, which give it, I mean, it, it creates an electrification of the figures. Um, there, there's this sort of dynamic um, electricity uh, that's running through the figures. And of course, the source of all light um, is divine light. So the, the, the tradition to which El Greco belongs, although he was a painter of his time, you know, owes a little bit to this idea of um, inner spiritual light. Um, and look briefly here at the work of a uh, fellow Spanish artist of the same period, Francisco Thurbaran. Um, the, the light here is a sort of quasi mix of the natural light and spiritual light because uh, St. Francis in meditation is quite clearly painted in very, very dark ground. Um, but the light that is illuminating St. Francis is the light of um, spiritual awareness. And um, it's these are very, very powerful paintings that use the uh, use the technique of chiaroscura, that's to say, uh, dramatic contrast of light and dark. And, you know, the originator of that is Caravaggio. Uh, it was also taken up by later artists who I'll speak of in a minute. So uh, we're going to just move on to the next section now. And the light of experience. And what I mean by that is uh, illuminatory light. That's to say the light of the natural world. And we're going to look at uh, Johannes Vermeer, Peter de Hoek and uh, Rembrandt van Rijn all Dutch painters working in the Dutch Golden Age, all within a few miles of each other. Uh, Rembrandt in Amsterdam, Vermeer in Delft, and um, I think De Hoop, um, possibly, if my art history serves correct, possibly in Harlem, but I'm not sure. But anyway, um, so in the previous section, we looked at the relationship of light as mystical drama or revelatory light. In the, in the Dutch golden age, and we're talking here about the 1620s, the 1630s, 1640s, light starts to become understood more in terms of an experiential light, especially in, the, in, in, in this period, in the early Dutch Republic, because it so happens that a number of discoveries in optics were made in Holland at the time. Lenses were being discovered and this, these scientific discoveries on optics can quickly be seen to be translated in practical visual terms in the works of artists like Vermeer and de Hoek. A more, uh, more humanist based context for the representation of, representation of light, both the human experience of the phenomena of light and of human experience itself became readily apparent in the work of Rembrandt. Gradually, a desacralization of light occurs in painting. This is replaced by representations of light which privilege human sense perception and, and an acknowledgement of an individualized human experience of light as something that plays to individual sense perception. So if we look here in the case of Rembrandt, painting of uh, his um, mistress, uh, Hendrika, Stoffel's, um, his partner, in fact, actually his common law wife. Um, it's a very, very touching portrait, a very intimate portrait, um, where Rembrandt is using chiaroscura, this dramatic use of light and shade. But it, it, this is not really meant to uh, speak of any kind of religious light per se. Um, you could argue that there is a certain amount of, you know, spirituality, um, but e equally, and I think perhaps the most overriding sense of this type of light is, it's a humanist light. It's a light of human sense perceptions. And um, the, the 
the, the period in Holland in, in, in which Rembrandt worked saw the emergence of, as I've said, optics and lenses and a, a sense of, of the, the value of the individual's perception of light. And there was a, a, a very a new collector market for art that reflected the everyday world of 17th century Holland. And that was the new bourgeois art market of the new burger class in Holland, merchants who'd, who'd made their money in the various industries in Holland at the time, the herring industry and uh, importing um, you know, import industries from the, uh, the, the Far East, the uh, great mercantile trade that was being conducted. And, and so uh, the patrons of, of Rembrandt, Vermeer and de Hoo wanted uh, an art that really wasn't about gods and the divine, but was about the, the lived bourgeois burger experience of um, the, the, if you like, uh, human, human, uh, human perceptions and the everyday lived experience of um, the life of Dutch cities and uh, in particular the, 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 the burger class. So if we look at this painting here by Vermeer, Girl at a Virginal um, in the National Gallery, uh, we see here the way Vermeer, you know, almost in a kind of uh, an act of prayerful devotion, um, paints this hymn to natural light, the natural light coming in through the windows, the very subtle shadows is casting on the plaster wall, um, the way light plays across different surfaces, gilded gold frames, the satin on the girl's dress, um, the, the way it, the light um, caresses the dress, the way it falls on the, um, the, 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 the wood of the, the harps called at which she's playing. And moving to the work of Peter de Hoek, um, it's almost a sort of a distillation of time in this painting. You know, uh, a, a woman uh, in a courtyard looking out onto the street, uh, the aperture of the door allowing in this shaft of light that illuminates uh, the courtyard and this beautiful milky quality that De Hoot creates by using um, many, many sort of bluey, uh, bluey green and gray glazes, milky glazes of oil paint over a sort of a mid-tone sort of warmish ground that you can see there in the shadow. Um, and it, like the Vermeer, it's, it, it has this sense of light being sort of a, an emblem of a moment in time, that light is actually the uh, vehicle by which time is represented. And there's a beautiful stillness uh, in these paintings because it's the stillness of the artist um, looking and representing the, the fall of light. Um, and it's in, uh, as I said just shortly before, it's almost a kind of, it's a hymn to looking. Um, so as we move on, um, we are going to move into a, a period now when basically um, natural philosophy, um, rationalism, uh, scientific inquiry really starts to replace a religious view of the world. And we're talking here about the early 18th century and throughout the 18th century. So in this section, in this period, light becomes uh, an aesthetic experience. That's to say light becomes a property that is experienced by individuals. And it's part of their, part of the individual's aesthetic experience as opposed to 
a property of the divine. So the primitive of individual perception of empirical evidence of the world features highly in painting of the enlightenment and the age of reason. The evidence of the senses is a feature of the paintings of Constable, Chardin, uh, which are informed by our respect for natural appearances. Individual sensibility is a characteristic feature of romanticism. An artist respond to the depiction of light in a way that is transmitted and transmuted according to the personal temperament of the artist. So Turner, for example, for whom the sun was God, adopts a pantheistic and immersive approach to the depiction of light that reveals a particular artistic personality. Whereas the German artist Caspar David Friedrich displaces the former religious depiction of light onto landscape, and thus his painting of light is imbued with a sense of religiosity. This also applies to the works of the Pre-Raphaelites in Britain, notably the artist Holman Hunt, his painting The Light of the World. In Impressionism, uh, Monet, Renoir, Seurat apply Chevrolet's scientific theory of complementary colour to overlay their personal sense perceptions with a scientific basis in colour theory to create paintings of spectacular luminosity. And we're going to look at uh, what this uh, last text means. So we're going to first of all look at John Constable. And Constable really is a great exemplar of uh, the kind of the period of the enlightenment of natural philosophy and of the, uh, the, the inquiry that was going on that was based on observation, the sense that individuals, that, that, that uh, people could learn about the world by trusting their observational skills and their perceptions and then, and then making deductions from that and applying applying those deductions in the creation of, of knowledge. So for example, Constable made numerous um, empirical studies of clouds. And you see this here in one of his large paintings. So he, he would make these cloud studies on quite small boards um, on, out, in the, out in the landscape. And then he would take those small studies on board back into the studio and, and make up his what he called his six footers, his large six foot paintings, which were meant for public display. The studies weren't uh, in Constable's time. They were not meant for display, just for really empirical scientific discovery so he could apply what he learned in those studies to the creation of his studio paintings. And you see here, he, he, this knowledge that he was gaining through observation allows him to paint the way light falls across meadows, the way light uh, fugitively runs across trees. The idea that the, the sky is, uh, the, uh, it, it, it's the grammar for the whole construction of the painting because the, the sky determines how the light falls on a landscape. In contrast, we see a different approach to light with the work of uh, uh, the German artist Caspar David Friedrich, who is an artist of uh, the Romantic period. Um, you know, Constable, and you know, contemporary of Constables. Um, but in in Friedrich's painting, um, light is uh, it's it's obviously seen as a property of the natural world. But in Friedrich's case, light is imbued with this sense of religiosity, um, the kind of the, the mistiness that you find in this painting, Winter Landscape, which is in the National Gallery. Um, the, the, the sort of indistinctness, um, and it's the combination of the, uh, the, the, the Church of God, which is being uh, obscured by, by this mist, this wintry mist, but it offers everlasting life. And that's mirrored in the fir trees, again, because fir trees are a symbol of uh, eternal life. And in the, in, the, in, the, in the figure of the boy here, 
who's abandoned his crutches and is praying to the crucifix. Um, a, a, it, it's, it's almost an, an essay in the um, the, uh, the 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 devoutness and piety that uh, Friedrich, who comes from the northern Baltic uh, German town of uh, Greifswald, uh, was um, imbuing in his work. So a work like this would have been painted at the beginning of the 19th century, um, probably 18, 1805, 1810, 1812. But if we move on another 40 or 50 years, we see kind of a, a comparative religiosity in the work of the British artist William Holman Hunt uh, in his famous painting, The Light of the World, which brings us back to the initial question, is the light of the world, that's the, uh, the religious light, the same light as the light of the Enlightenment? Well, in the case of this painting, uh, Hunt depicts a religious subject, uh, uh, Christ, um, and uh, Christ holding the lamp, uh, illuminating the path, and the painting is obviously uh, meant to convey a religious message. But the way the light is depicted, uh, Holman Hunt is, is actually using a, a kind of a naturalistic light, a naturalistic nocturnal light. Um, Holman Hunt is not using an inner spiritual light as we see in the work of El Greco, for example. By this time, light is well and truly a property of the real earthly physical world. Although in the case of William Holman Hunt's painting, um, the, the light refers to um, the, you know, Christ's light of the world. So uh, he, he's, he's, he's making uh, light uh, a, a reference a symbolic reference to uh, the eternal light. But Holman Hunt and the Pre-Raphaelites were really the last vestiges of a, a religious uh, view of the, the world. And they're kind of outriders in the art of the 19th century um, in the sense that the by, by, by the middle of the 19th century, the, the predominance in art, art, artistic production in Western Europe was probably uh, loaded towards secular imagery. In fact, it was loaded towards secular imagery. And so uh, Holman Hunt, Millet, and some of the other pre-Raphaelites, they were kind of, they were at odds with the prevailing currents they wanted to hark back to a time before Raphael uh, to almost medieval aesthetics. Um, but in, 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 in that sense, they were, um, they were, they were part of a, a kind of a, uh, a nostalgic revivalist um, movement in art, but in, in its own curious way, um, they were quite cutting edge in their pictorial language. But um, artists in France, um, for whom there was a, you know, a, a, more, a much more progressive bourgeois um, public for their work, um, were well and truly steeped in the idea of, of uh, phenomenology and an art of perception. And you see this in Monet's painting uh, now, uh, Monet, uh, obviously the originator of Impressionism, um, Monet and the other Impressionists had, had been, been aware of scientific discoveries that happened in France in the middle of the 19th century by a French scientist called Eugène Chevreau, um, who basically stated that the way human beings um, could perceive light 
in terms of its representation on a painting is if that light was broken down into indiv individual pure spectrum colours, say for example, blue, yellow, red. Um, and if those pure colours were put um, against one another, not over one another, but against one another, just lying on the canvas as separate patches of colour next to one another, um, what the human eye does as a, uh, a matter of um, physiology, it optically mixes those colours and it creates this great sensation of luminosity. And um, Eugene Chevrel also uh, basically formulated the idea of complementary colour, of which a lot of the Impressionist art is based. That's to say, of the three primary colours, red, yellow and blue, they are, they are opposite colours on the colour wheel are orange to blue, um, green to red, and violet to yellow. And that means that when you put, for example, yellow next to violet, it, it, it sings in an intensity that you don't get with any other colour combination. Likewise, the same with red to green, likewise the same with orange to blue. And that's known as simultaneous colour contrast. And, th and these ideas very much inform the art of Impressionism, um, which was an art of, of, of plain air painting, because by now the collapsible oil painting tube had been developed. And so you have the representation of natural light out in the open air, and paintings were being made in the open air. Um, some of Monet's paintings, a lot of the water lily seers were made in his studio, but he would probably start a lot of the paintings outdoor in the gardens at Giverny. And here we see this beautiful evocation of it looks like a twilight, an early evening light. Um, next, we see a painting by Georges Seurat, who's actually employing the whole principles of Eugene Chevrol in, in the idea of simultaneous colour contrast of small patches of colour, complementary colour, um, being optically mixed by our eye. He actually painted them on the canvas as small patches of colour sitting next to one another, uh, blues, greens, reds, violets. But when, when we look at the painting, our eye optically mixes those colours and gives the painting this wonderful sort of colour luminosity, especially if you look at the, the shadow areas of the figures here. So um, this was the way painting was going towards an ever greater uh, sense of uh, perception. But then um, something really fundamental happens with painting. Um, and you got to bear in mind that by now we've entered basically the, the 20th century. And uh, by now the, the use of a new technological medium in the early 19th century, let's say the 1830s, photography uh, that created images based on a chemical reaction to light has a profound and far reaching impact on traditional painting. Appearances of light can now be recorded and reproduced on a mass scale and its evolution into the moving photographic image, brackets, cinema, close brackets, toward the end of the 19th century, means that the representation of light in painting either ceases to be about the mimetic copying of natural appearances, but painting itself. The surface, the surface of painting starts to become the generator of light, as for example can be seen in the work of Matisse, the Red Studio and later abstract expressionist works of Mark Rothko, Clifford Still and Barnett Newman, or painting mimics the photographic surface as in the paintings of Gerhard Richter, who is once quoted as saying, I make photographs using paint. Andy Warhol's painted, painted silk screens and photographs from mass culture. The possibilities which digital technologies have afforded the representation of light in painting are exemplified 
more latterly in the work of Jeff Koons, whose hyperreal, hyperluminous pop, uh, pop images from mass consumer culture uh, really under, underscore the representation of light in the technological and digital age. And we're going to first of all look at Henri Matisse's painting, The Red Studio. And this is a fundamental change in the representation of pictorial light in painting. So the light is no, no longer an illusory light, um, as in, for example, the Monet, um, or indeed the Syrah, you know, an illusion is not being created here. Light is not the product of some tricks of, of, of the painter who skillfully conjures up the appearance of light. No, uh, what, what Matisse is doing here is he's actually using colour and colour alone to generate light. So um, it's, you know, paintings like this, um, came to be very influential on uh, later generations of artists in post-war America, um, the abstract expressionists and, and beyond them, because it's what Matisse is here creating is a, uh, a field of color. You know, this type of painting came to be known in post-war American artists as, as color field painting, because it's, it's basically a field of color um, uh, upon which Mat Matisse has um, inscribed, possibly with a palette knife, the, um, the uh, artifacts of his studio. But they, they're all encompassed, enveloped within this phenomenal red light. Um, there are um, uh, other colors, so Matisse has actually recreated some of his own paintings using colours, um, but they're all subordinate to the, the overlying redness of this painting. And it, this painting proved very influential on the art of Mark Rothko, because it was hanging, this painting was hanging in the Museum of Modern Art, and Rothko would go every day to look at this painting. And uh, it's not a, a million miles away from uh, Rothko's uh, maroon and red stacks of colour. Uh, it had a profound effect on, on Rothko. And indeed, this is a truly um, seminal, profound painting. But um, so as well as painting generate its own light, painters in the post-war period um, really were surrounded by a culture of mediated imagery. And we see this in the paintings of Gerhard Richter, who um, actually works from the photographic image, but actually makes photographs using painting, using paint, oil paint. This is an oil painting by Gerhard Richter. Um, and he is here employing the kind of depth of field and soft focus that, you know, photography confers on the image. And uh, Richter is, is here employing this sort of soft focus photographic light um, in his paintings. Um, he's almost, as it were, standing back as the artist and quite anonymously creating these images of uh, light um, that are referencing, um, you know, photo, photochemical processes. Um, equally with the artist Andy Warhol, um, again, who would use photography and then create um, photographic silk screens, uh, which would then be printed using silk screen onto canvas. And then Warhol or his assistants would then apply color by way of 
acrylic color um, or squeegee color um, onto the onto the surface of the of the prints and um, so light is in in the both of the past two cases is certainly seen as a product of uh, photographic technologies in the final um, slides um, we see here a painting by Jeff Coons and in, in Coons work um, light is taken to a hyper real degree as to say it is it has gone beyond photographic light although Coons has used you know photographic digital technologies to um, uh, to bring about these images which are painstakingly painted by a whole army of assistants in his studios but the the, the light that, that his images reference is a truly um, mediated artificial light it's a synthetic light and it's a light that can only exist on uh, it's an electronic light the light of um, a digital screen um, because it he, Coons is using mass information technologies to make representations of you know pop culture a mass information pop culture and um, you know a cherry on an ice cake is um, as valid in terms of its you know iconog iconographic significance as a, uh, a a depiction of a saint was in former times the uh, the values that light uh, represented in medieval renaissance painting baroque painting are here transposed onto a an earthly light but it's a man-made light it's an artificial synthetic light that is is purely the creation of man so we've traveled from uh light being the property of um god in the 14th century to light really being a property of uh, man's ingenuity invention and um, his um, um, you know his complete uh, sovereignty over the uh, the physical world so I'm just going to end uh, with one of my own paintings uh, Ece Ancela Domini again where in this painting light is is again references um, both photographic light in this case the actual color negative so there are quotations from uh, religious iconography El Greco religious iconography and fashion photography but uh, light again is is mediated in the sense that it's a color reversal so um, I'm hoping that you've all enjoyed this sort of brief introduction to uh, light and its uh, various modes of representation over the past six seven hundred years and we come back to the question posed at the beginning of this uh, video is whether the religious light of the world the light of the world is the same light as the light of the enlightenment and um, I think what is probably fair to say is that um, they are one is in the other one is the same light as the other 
but according to period, culture, and uh, the representations those uh, different dynamics have on uh, visual representation. Uh, different cultures and different time periods express light differently. So if you've enjoyed this uh, talk, please subscribe to uh, the art class online, or if you'd like to take one of our courses, please visit www.theartclassbexley.co.uk. Thank you for listening to this video and um, uh, enjoy looking at light. Thank you.